Hey gang, I am Joe Whittleman and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. And Happy New Year. A bunch of you have said Happy New Year in the chat. Same right back at you. We got a lot to plan for this year and a lot to do. So we'll get to that. Uh, for those of you that are watching live and are here, please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you are watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. You are still an important part of this process. Leave me a comment below the video so that I know you are here. All right? Already, and we got a lot of people here. Right? Grant's here from Los Angeles. I got FN89 up in Canada. Uh, Jay in Southern Colorado. Uh, let's see, we got Danny in Vegas. Hector in Ontario. Joe in Michigan. David in San Diego. Calvin in Maine. Uh, Chris, first time. In Toronto, don't miss your bus, Chris. Uh, let's see, Michael's here in Texas. Alan in Denmark. Lynn in New York. I got Robert in Albuquerque. Uh, and where are we at here? Blair's here. I think Blair's in, uh, there it is, Alberta, Canada. All right, cool. Uh, Jubilani, I hope I got that right, is here from Zimbabwe. Darren from the UK. I'm sorry, I nerd out about that. How cool is it that we are all around the world and we're able to take an hour and talk about photography? I think that's absolutely awesome. So photo news, let's start there. I made you the promise last year, I'm not gonna do a ton of photo news. So the only thing, I, I saw this as I was prepping things tonight and getting set up, and I thought, you know what, it's worth just mentioning uh, because for a long time, Nikon was like the kicking post of all the full frame camera manufacturers because they were last of the party and slow to get a system together for mirrorless cameras. Well, there you go. In Japan, 2023, Nikon tops the sales chart. And yes, Canon, Sony, they're still going strong. Uh, Olympus and Panasonic, yeah, not so much. Fuji is so so. Uh, but yeah, see, there is, that's Japanese for Nikon was amazing this year. I'm just kidding. I have no idea what that means, but Hey, it was a big year for Nikon. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, my two cents for what it's worth. I think what we're going to start to see now over the next, I don't know, let's say probably five years, I think we are going to see the whole camera war and camera race settle down a lot. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Um, it doesn't mean we're not going to see new stuff. I said that to somebody earlier today and they're like, oh my God, but I don't want the innovation to stop. I don't want the innovation to stop either. I think we're still going to see some incredible innovation. Uh, obviously, Sony kind of put their fingers on this scale with the global shutter this year. And I think we'll see Canon and Nikon and uh, eventually certainly Panasonic and, and um Olympus and Fuji, I think we'll see them, you know, jump onto that bandwagon. I don't think you're going to see it real quick on any of them. Uh, and I don't think there's a need. Keep in mind that A93 is, it's kind of a, um, I hate to say prototype because you can go buy it, right? But it's really a, a proof of concept camera for Sony. Um, there are extremely few photographers who need that camera. There are extremely few photographers whose work will actually benefit from that camera. Fortunately for Sony, there's a lot of people with money to throw around that'll be crazy enough to go buy it. But for the people that, you know, can actually put it to use and make a difference in their photography, they're essentially going to help Sony be able to prove that global shutters are the future. And just like any other piece of technology, the longer we have them, the more we see them used, the price is going to come down, the quality level will go up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I predict that this year we will start to see a ton of images with global shutters, obviously from the Olympics. You can bet your life Sony's making big plans to have shooters using that camera like crazy so that they can, of course, also, you know, boast about the results. So I think we'll see that coming. But what I do think we're, we're getting to, um, and part of the reason why I asked the question at the beginning of the chat, which, by the way, just put a pin on that camera conversation for just a second. I asked the question about how many photographers that are here that are watching live are intending to uh, try to make money with their photography in 2024. 65% um, of you that are here watching live are, 
here's the word, intending to make money with your cameras this year. Why do we not get more questions about business and marketing? Why? Just keeping it real, gang, but you know full well, if I go and start digging for some of your websites and some of your social media profiles, y'all got a lot of work to do to get your act together, right? Most of you will turn around and say, I suck at social media. I just don't know what the best things are to do. How do I keep up with all of it? Let's talk about that stuff. Let's solve some business problems. I think it's awesome that there are that many people that intend to make money, but let's take that intent Let's turn it into action and create some success with that, right? Okay, so back to the business thing, though. And this kind of ties together, believe it or not. We're reaching a point where if, if we're just keeping it real, so we've got to set gas, gear acquisition syndrome aside, right? We've got to set the fact that, you know, boys like their toys aside, we're getting to the point that these new cameras are bringing us quality levels and features that 99% of us don't need. It's just that simple. And especially like if you're shooting portraits and weddings, believe me, you don't need half of the stuff that's coming out because your clients, even if you're making big wall prints, they're not going to think your pictures are any better because of it. So the good news, not for you gearheads, but the good news is chill out about the gear. Settle down. And I do, I seriously think you're going to see the industry, meaning photographers en masse, start to chill out. Uh, when cameras are costing anywhere from three to $6,000, and you're going to start to see cameras top that $7,000 mark consistently because of inflation, it's getting to the point that you simply can't justify. It's like, oh, every 18 months, Sony has a new camera. I got to go buy that. Why? What is it doing for you? Are you buying it just so you can tell your buddies, hey, look, I got it, right? So the good part is we're going to be able to slow down with cameras, right? That will upset the gearheads. And look, if that's your thing, cool, that's your thing. But if pure photography is your thing and maybe making money, then you can't be a gearhead because those two things are not going to work well together. So I really do. I think we're going to see things slow down. I think we will potentially see this kind of race to who sells the most cameras, who has the most popular cameras. I think we're going to see it even out a little bit. Obviously, Canon and Nikon have made tremendous strides catching up to Sony. Uh, and you know, from a quality standpoint, from a feature standpoint, they're every bit as innovative. You know, maybe Sony has a, a little bit of a lead with the innovation and because they're much more aggressive. But keep in mind, Sony's also much more incentivized to do that simply because Sony doesn't actually make the bulk of their money. Their camera division doesn't make the bulk of their money from cameras. They make it from sensors that they sell to other manufacturers. So the Sony cameras, for all of us running around with Sony cameras, we're basically helping ensure that Sony sells a lot of sensors to other companies because it's essentially proof of concept, right? And that's cool. They keep giving me great technology and they keep the ergonomics in the Sony cameras the way they are. I'm happy with my Sony. Um, but yeah, so we're going we're gonna to start to see the market settle down. I'm confident that's going to happen. A um, couple other things that I want to share real quick on the education note. All right, so the first one is a class that I have coming up. This is on January 16th. This is a two-hour master class. Cooley, I saw you sneak in here late, but I'm glad you're here. It's okay. Um, a two-hour master class all about mastering exposure and achieving perfect exposure in every shot. So obviously, you know, I've been talking a ton about exposure lately. 2024 for me is going to be the year of exposure. It's going to be kind of an ongoing nonstop conversation. And just in case you haven't heard the why behind that, for all these years that I've been teaching, one of the things that has always been a huge head scratcher for me, looking at other photographers work, even people that are making money and even people that are paying their bills with their cameras, 
looking at their raw work from a wedding, from a portrait session, from a modeling shoot, whatever, and honestly being really baffled by how variable the exposures were all over the place and not intentionally. That's really problematic. And it's, it's really problematic because the gear that we have today makes it so easy to ensure that you never have that problem. The gear that we have today makes it so easy to ensure that you come out 99.9% .9 of the time with perfect exposures. It really is easy. So this program is gonna talk about how you do it, not just for mirrorless cameras. This will also deal with um, DSLR cameras and even a little bit with film. But most of the conversation you'll hear me having, including some of the conversation we're gonna to have tonight, is gonna to be based on mirrorless cameras, kind of the second generation of digital cameras. But I dropped a link in the chat. That's coming up again on January 16th. The cost is $20. You will receive a digital download that goes with that. You'll also be able to watch it for 72 hours afterwards. Um, but um, the digital download has a lot of great tips, a lot of suggestions, also breaks down a lot of the information for you so you can have a copy of it and kind of review it uh, you know, as you have time after the fact. Um, so also, while we are talking about education, since I just mentioned a few minutes ago um, some articles that I have, I want to share this one, which is not about exposure. I've been sharing this online. I'm going to share, let's get rid of the Facebook piece there. Sorry about that. Let's, um, I'm going to share this with all of you now. If you haven't seen it, uh, I strongly encourage you to read it. And this is not just a business article. It, it mentions one or two business things. This is really like for all of you. This, or this is 16 things that I do religiously every year. Um, usually in the month of December this year, I'm not going to lie. I've been a little late. So I got most of it done in December. Uh, some of it I was actually working on finishing up today, but these are things that are going to help you, uh, keep up to date with all your filing, keeping your gear in good shape. Uh, it's also simple things too. Like if you have a website, make sure the copyright notice on your website says 2024. In fact, by the way, here, I'll give you guys a little tip. If you have a website, let me scroll down to my copyright notice all the way at the bottom. So it's going to be in the bottom left of the screen there. I want you to notice how my copyright notice says 2000 to 2024. That's the proper way to do a copyright notice on your website. 2000 is the year that joeedelman.com went live. So it's basically saying that this website has existed and is copyrighted from 2000 to 2024. So just putting a copyright and this year, unless your website's brand new, that's an incorrect copyright format. Also, a lot of you probably have um, copyright information or photo credit information set up in your cameras. Most of that information you have to put in manually. So if you've manually added the year into that information, it gets embedded in the metadata of your file make sure you go into your camera, change that over to 2024. And for that matter, make sure you're checking the date settings in your cameras. Most cameras don't automatically roll over. So make sure that you have switched that stuff over to 2024 so that you're good to go. So that's just a, a little tip. It's there. I think you'll find most of the stuff helpful. Most people, the feedback I've gotten is like, yeah, a lot of the stuff I do and a lot of this stuff I've never even thought about, but man, I really should be doing this. So that's that one. Now, back to the uh, exposure conversation. Since we're, we're doing all this stuff on my website, let me do this now and get it out of the way, and then we'll get back to uh, the things that we need to talk about with exposure. So there's four articles that I posted right before New Year's. I am going to encourage you wholeheartedly, sincerely, read all four of them. It will take at least 30 minutes of your life to do it. I know that's a big ask. I promise you, you will not feel as though you have wasted your time. You have my word. There's no clickbait here. There's no fluff. This is 30 minutes of serious information about exposure, especially, specifically, with digital mirrorless cameras. So the first article, and I'm going to drop the uh, links into the chat, 
They are also already in the description below the video, so feel free to check them out afterwards. First one is all about the exposure triangle and what does it have in common with the Brooklyn Bridge? Um, you've all heard me talk about the exposure triangle bef before and kind of what a, what a joke it is. Uh, here's all the facts. Here's all the proof so that hopefully we can put that to bed forever. Mind you, there are some middle-aged and older photographers online that seem to feel that it can never be put to bed, but they're wrong. I'm right. They just haven't figured that out yet. And that's not an ego thing. That's not me being arrogant. It's just a fact. Read the article. You won't be disappointed. Okay? The next one is all about sensors. Let me tell you why this article is important. Number one, the internet. That's why it's important. There is so much bad information on the internet. Shocker, right? But let me explain why it's bad. You notice I didn't say wrong information. I said bad information, right? Um, there is a lot of information that gets into the weeds, shall we say. Engineering speak. It's not wrong, but it's also not going to impact your photography on a regular basis, if ever at all, right? So from an educational standpoint and also a learning standpoint, there comes the question, well, do we cover all of that little minutia when we're trying to teach people who are looking to build consistency and how to do exposure? And the simple answer is absolutely not. So what I've done is I've worked really hard here to take the really technical information and clarify it in a much simpler way. That is what the second article is. My goal with that article is to clarify what ISO really is with a digital mirrorless camera and also how it works with a digital mirrorless camera because it is nothing like film at all. Not even close. Okay? So the third article is the one you see on the screen now. The Must Try ISO Tolerance Test. Just drop the link for that one into the chat, or at least I thought it did. Sorry, nope, I didn't. Let me get that one for you here. Um, now, you're all going to like hate me just a tiny bit for this one because I've created a new term and a new task that you have to learn and do. I apologize. But you'll thank me for it. Some of you had already kind of done this you know, I've heard from quite a few photographers, oh, I kind of did something similar and I totally get it and I'm on board. I know what my ISO tolerance is. A lot of photographers are like, I've never even heard that. I don't know what it is. This is not some photography term. This is a Joe Edelman term that I'm sharing with you. Understand your ISO tolerance. It will eliminate a tremendous amount of the stress about how high is too high with ISO. Because believe me, if you're following the old guidelines, and when I say old, this is 10 years ago, this for that matter, five years ago of always try to shoot at your base ISO, period, you're really missing out on a lot of opportunities with your cameras. The cameras today can handle higher ISO without a loss in quality. Now, there is a point where you do begin to lose quality, okay? Generally and most prominently, that is going to be in the terms of increased noise. There is, as you raise the ISO dramatically, a drop in dynamic range. We'll talk about that in a minute because I promise you, 99.9% .9 of the time, you do not ever need to remember that sentence that I just uttered. But there are some technical people, it's the engineers, that love to get into the weeds and talk about what ifs. So we'll talk about it. Because at some point, you'll hear somebody say it. So I'll assure you why you don't need to worry about it. Okay? But the ISO tolerance test simply is a way for you to determine what is the maximum ISO that I am comfortable with before I start to get too much noise? 
This breaks down step-by-step -step how to do it. I even have a video that walks you through with my Sony a7 IV, the results. My ISO tolerance is 8,000, and that's without using any noise reduction whatsoever. Above 8,000, I will begin to use noise reduction, and of course, then we get all the way up to the top. You do reach a point where the files are just completely unusable, okay? So that is the third article on the set. And then the fourth article is what I would encourage you to use as your approach to how you set your exposure. Choose your shutter speed with purpose, your aperture with feeling, and then adjust the brightness with ISO. So you've got all four links in the chat. All four links are in the description below the video, plus I've been sharing them all over social media. Um, again, it'll take you easily about 30 minutes to read all four articles. I promise you, you will not feel as though you have wasted your time, regardless of your skill level. You have my word. And sincerely, I will say this now again. I've said it every time I've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. After you've read it, if you feel I'm wrong, if you feel that I'm just full of crap, and spouting off a bunch of crap to make myself sound like I know what the hell I'm talking about. I want to know, but I want to know the right way. If you're going to go to social media or you're going to come in here and just say, that's wrong, that's a bunch of crap, that's a bunch of bull, I'll simply delete you and then block you. I have no patience for that. There's no value to that. You're not helping anybody. If you want to come to me with questions and say, listen, my understanding is this. So how do you square that with what you're proposing? You will have my dedicated attention. In fact, I've already offered in the past, if you really think I'm off, this doesn't have to be a public conversation. Reach out to me through my website on the contact page and I'll send you a link. We'll schedule a Zoom call and we'll chat. Here's why that's important to me. I want this piece of information that I'm sharing. I want this concept that I'm sharing. I want it to be right. I want it to work. I'm convinced it is much better than the way we have been talking about and teaching photography for the last 20 years. So if I'm missing something, believe me, I want to know about it. So that being said, you've got all that information. I saw Cooley's got a question here. If you still have DSLRs, uh, how do you do ISO tolerance? Cooley, um, that's a great question. So if you still have a DSLR, I would still encourage you to do ISO tolerance. And the test that's outlined in that article will work on a DSLR. It's the fourth article where I talk about shutter speed with purpose, aperture with feeling, and adjust the brightness with ISO. You will have to do a slightly modified version of that because with the DSLR, you don't have an EVF. For those of you that may be beginners, that's the electronic viewfinder, which means you're not seeing the finished image as you shoot. Um, I'll gladly come back to that when we get into the Q&A coolly and try and break that down for you a little bit more about how you can use it with your DSLR. But the ISO tolerance test, everything that's outlined in that uh, article will absolutely work uh, on a DSLR. And I would encourage you, even as a DSLR owner, to do that test. And you don't need to do it for, for all of you now. You don't need to do the test for every single camera body you use. You need to do the test for every single model camera that you use. So if you have, I have two Sony a7IVs. I don't need to test each body. I just need to test one of them. They're both going to give me essentially the same result, right? So um, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a massively big project. You can do the test uh, easily in about 30 minutes, probably even less if you, depending on your skill level and, and comfort with the stuff we're talking about. But it's not a particularly difficult uh, test to do. It doesn't require a whole bunch of fancy setup. Uh, as you'll read in the article, the example that I have set up there, I used my mannequin and I wanted a, a very bright and very dark section in the background. I, believe me, you could do that at your kitchen table, in your kitchen, in your living room, in your house. doesn't need to be a fancy setup. doesn't need to take a lot of time. That article breaks all of that down, okay? All right, so we're gonna come back to the exposure stuff. Let's go ahead and do our quote of the week and then we'll hop back in.
All right, so this week, I have a quote that um, I shared the other day on social media. It is from an iconic uh, portrait photographer who uh, was born in Latvia, did most of his work um, in the United States, and that person is Philip Halsman. Um, the quote, in fact, actually, let me switch over to this screen. The quote, the immortal photographers will be straightforward photographers. Those who do not rely on tricks or special techniques. So what's interesting about this quote, two things, we're going to work it backwards. Let me tell you what happened when this quote was shared the other day, because I don't believe that any of you that are here watching are guilty of what I'm about to describe. But if you are, shame on you. And if you're not, good for you. When this post went up, as with some of the other quotes that have been shared over the last year, because it's been a year now that I've been doing them, and it's going to continue. I still have a lot of quotes that um, you have not seen. Um, there were numerous people who took to social media with comments of like, I disagree, that's wrong, BS, and so forth. So I've adopted a policy on my social media. And for those of you that are trying to make some money in photography, I would encourage you to adopt the same policy. Now, obviously, you're not going to be posting quotes from other photographers and that kind of stuff if you're trying to get clients. But in general, understand that your social media page, that is your business. When you walk into a store, when you walk into a Starbucks, when you walk into any store, there's a, essentially a code of conduct. There's things that are acceptable, there's things that aren't acceptable. And that store, they set the rules. So understand that your Facebook page, your Instagram profile, if you are using that to market yourself to clients, that is your business space. Now, you have to abide by the platform's rules, Facebook, Instagram, etc. But beyond that, you set your own rules. So when photographers hit my page, even though social media rewards us for engagement, if somebody's going to be rude, because that's the word, rude, and post, I disagree, wrong, whatever, I'm deleting the comment. No questions asked, no apologies made. I'm deleting the comment. Now, just like I talked about with the exposure conversation, if somebody comes to one of those and posts a question, in other words, puts in a little bit of effort and says, well, how do you square that with this? I'm thrilled. I get very excited by those because there's a good conversation that can be had. There's something that can be learned. But just disagreeing benefits no one. Because first of all, ironically, there's nothing in my posts that ask for an opinion. So why do you think anybody cares about your opinion? I mean, just keeping it real, right? So I bring this up now as a couple of reasons. One, it's a chance for me to vent. I'll own that. Two, since I already see there's some questions about social media and business, thank you. You need to understand you're going to deal with this stuff. And you also need to understand that you need to kind of change your outlook. And I'll be accused of being racist for this statement, but it's reverse racism. 99% of the comments that I get to start with wrong, I disagree, all that kind of crap. It's from middle-aged and older white males. Why is that? Why do you feel like you are obligated to comment. These posts are for you to learn from. These posts are there for you to consider what this iconic photographer said, because there ain't nobody commenting on my posts. This is iconic. It's the photographers who made these quotes. Sorry, but they're not. So this is a learning experience. I'm pretty sure most of us were taught by our parents when we were younger. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say it. So for those of you that are looking to make money, of which 62% of you now in the poll say you want to, learn that lesson. 
and I'll trust that you aren't any of the people that have done this. I had somebody accuse me earlier today of it being all about my ego. Period. You can accuse me of whatever you want. When I went to school, and I know this is exactly the same as when you went to school, all of you, I'm talking to you right through that camera. Grade school, high school, college. There was only one instructor in the classroom at a time. By the time you got to high school and by the time you got to college, there were oftentimes similar topics or the same topics that you would wind up having first with one instructor and then later with another instructor, and they might disagree. They may teach something differently or a different set of facts. And then you, as a presumably intelligent human being, would have to decide which version makes most sense to you and which version will you carry forward in your life. I trust all of you with that ability. But it's my classroom. I share my experience. You've never heard me say that my version is the only version. You've never heard me say my version is the right version. I share my experience. I trust you to take that and do with it as you wish. So that being said, for those of you that may have been guilty of that, think about that. And look, to be clear, I, I want to make, make very clear, I'm not sitting on some soapbox talking down at people. Because when people do that to me, here's why I'm not talking down. When people do that to me, I want to argue back. That's my gut instinct. I'm not proud of that. I'm just admitting. My gut instinct is to be equally as rude. And sometimes I fail. I'm not proud of that. But for the most part, I have been able to adapt and I simply delete the comments. I don't give them a second thought because they add nothing to the conversation. If something adds to the conversation, moves the conversation forward and benefits the greater good, Hell yes, let's talk about it, right? That's the idea. So here's the cool thing about Philip Halsman. Um, one person who, with a very good, well-worded comment, pointed out, well, isn't that like saying that Ansel Adams is not a particularly great photographer? Or in this case, you know, they use the word immortal. And let's face it, Ansel Adams, he's immortal. Because Ansel Adams was the biggest trickster of them all. He was the Photoshop master before we'd even dreamed of Photoshop, right? And his work is incredible. I interpret this, and by the way, in fact, let me share the link with you guys. I'm going to switch over to the browser. I have a page on my website all about Philip Paulsman. Uh, you can learn about him. His bio's there. You can see some of his quotes, actually see some interviews with him. Um, he does a series of images or did a series of images during his life where he would have his subjects, usually celebrities, uh, famous people like Marilyn Monroe, he would have them jump. And he has this whole series of pictures that he did. Oftentimes he jumped with them in the photograph. I love them because they're, they're just so much fun. There's so much energy in them. Uh, and you can also, from this page, you can click to view images uh, by Philly Paulsman. You'll see this down in the lower left-hand corner of the page there, right? But... Um, I honestly think that this quote, uh, and this is just my interpretation. I, I don't know this for a fact. The man is long past. I think this is m really a matter of him being modest because he relied on a lot of tricks in his images. Uh, his Probably one of his most famous images is the incredible image of Salvador Dali uh, at the easel and he's jumping in the air and the easel is in the air and there's cats, wet cats flying through the air. So he had assistants throwing the cats in from, you know, off camera and all this kind of stuff. He did lots of trickery and lots of special techniques. So I really sincerely believe this was a case of him saying, I don't think that I will ever be immortal or that my work is, should we say, worthy. Little did he know his work is incredible and it is immortal by today's standards. So I encourage you, uh, check it out. His work, uh, I, it's actually, it's a lot of fun, really incredible images. Um, and look, I realize we're all busy. I realize one of the biggest challenges that you all face is you want to learn as much as you can about photography, but the challenge is finding 
enough time. What I'm trying to share with you and the reason why I'm putting the energy and the effort into this, I was stupid when I was younger. Literally, I'll own that. I'm not proud of it. Some of my early mentors tried to share with me the work of people like Halsman, Ansel Adams, uh, Steichen, Brasson, Weston, all of these people. In fact, one of my, my biggest mentors uh, was a huge fan of Weston and had Weston images all around his office and studio. To me, as a young photographer, those photographers were old. They were photographers of yesterday. I had zero interest in them because I was living in that moment, in that day, and I wanted to look forward and be me. So the only good part about my attitude, because it was an attitude and it was a stupid attitude, but the only good part was I was committed to creating my, my own path and my own style. The dumb part was because of my stubbornness, arrogance, whatever you want to call it, I never actually took the time to try and learn about these photographers because had I done that, I would have realized how much I could learn from them and their experiences and how it would have actually helped me shape my own style and my own kind of photography. Part of the reason why these photographers are immortal, iconic, whatever you want to call it, is because their work is very well documented and because they have published a lot of books, a lot of articles, a lot of information about how and why they did what they did. So believe me, I know that all of you at some point in your photography life have heard somebody tell you you should study the work of others. I heard that when I was 11 years old and got my first camera. The difference is back then the work of others was people like Philip Paulsman, Brasson, Weston, Adams, all those people. Now when people here study the work of others, they think they should go to Instagram. I'm sorry, and I'm not insulting anybody, but you're not learning anything from those people on Instagram because they're just sharing their work. They're not telling you how they did it. They're not telling you why they did it. They're not informing you about what it really takes to make a picture. They're just sharing their best work. Believe me, there's some incredibly brilliant work on Instagram. So I'm not knocking any Instagram photographers, but I'm talking about the idea that studying the work of other photographers is about studying the work. How? Why? What went into it? What did it take? What was involved in creating a lifetime and a body of work that at this point has stood the test of time? That's where the value is. So I've got a link to the Halsman page. Uh, I dropped it in the chat. It's also in the um, description below the video. Uh, I would check it out, look at some of his, his images. Like I said, his images are a ton of fun. Um, and of course, if, in case you're not following me, Facebook, Twitter, X, LinkedIn, uh, also Blue Sky, that's the new Twitter knockoff. Uh, I'm on there even, as Joe Edelman. Uh, I post a quote from a well-known photographer um, every day, Monday through Friday, along with a link that takes you to a page on my website where you can see videos about them, uh, check out their books, read their bio, all of that kind of stuff. So check it out. Also, a reminder, you know I have to ask this every week. All of you, you're part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. Honestly, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. Okay, so back to the exposure conversation. Um, one of the things that I should have anticipated, uh, I did anticipate, but I guess maybe I hoped it would be a little different, um, that when I shared this information, people are finding this information in a lot of different ways, right? Some are finding my links to the articles and they're actually taking the time to read the articles. Others are finding like yesterday, my quote, um, you know, there is no triangle. Um, choose your shutter speed with purpose, your aperture with feeling, and adjust the brightness with ISO. Um, I found that a lot of people who found the quote just immediately, without 
going to read the articles, shocker, had to throw in an opinion that says, well, I do this, and for this I need this, or I do that, or I pick Aperture first because Aperture is the most important setting to me, all of which are things, by the way, that are addressed in the articles. So it brings us back to one point that's actually a bigger point about photography and about you learning photography. One of the things that actually makes photography hard, aside from all of the incredible technology we have and all the great tools that we have and all of the amazing learning resources that we have, the only thing that has set answers, like it's always right if this is the question and this is the answer, is the physics part of photography. That's the only thing that can have 100% correctness 100% of the time. Everything else in photography is influenced by creativity, vision, style, desire, choices, needs, the why behind the picture. So as a result of that, when we talk about photography and different genres of photography, different styles of shooting, different types of shooting, understand that generally speaking, the conversations will be general unless stated otherwise. Because if they're not, they're going to simply overwhelm people. So for the folks that have always made Aperture their first priority, you have two choices. If you actually read the articles, I explain why I encourage you choosing the shutter speed first. That's not prioritizing aperture, that's just choosing shutter speed first. If aperture is the most important uh, setting for you, it should remain the most important setting. At no point have I said anything to anyone that tells them what your most important setting should be. Period. And by the way, uh, I believe, well, I know I said this in the articles, and I believe I said this each of the times we talked about this previously. If you're happy with your photography, and if you go out and you shoot, I don't care if it's on vacation or if it's an event or whatever it is, and you download your images and you have consistently great exposure, good for you. You've done the hard work. You don't have to pay attention to any of this. But if you're like the majority of people who want to continue to learn and evolve and improve, because there's always room for improvement, sorry, but there is, then you might at least want to check this out and give it a try and consider it. Because you'll probably find at least partial use for it. So one question that was brought up to me um, through my talk knowledge community, and I wanted to address this for everyone because I left it out of the conversation. I am going to add a, a small update, but I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on it. If we get into the weeds for a minute, one of the other things that happens when you raise your ISO and your cameras is you reduce the dynamic range that your camera has. Literally by... 50% or slightly more than 50%, depending on how high you go with the ISO, right? But here's the thing, and interestingly enough, and I'm not making fun of this person, in fact, this person's here listening right now, but they actually gave me the perfect example. This person is a landscape shooter and they use a landscape example and point it out with their camera if they move their ISO up to 6,500 that it cuts their dynamic range by more than half. 6,500 for landscape photography. If you're shooting an ISO 6,500 for a landscape work, you've got bigger problems. Just saying. I'm not aware of any situations for landscape photography that would require that high an ISO. 
So it's a completely correct statement that going up to 6,500 is going to cut the dynamic range down by about half. But the worst part is most people never even think about dynamic range when they're looking at a scene. Now, does that make it right? No. Ideally, you should be. To the extent that you should be looking at a scene and realizing, hey, this is an extreme lighting situation. I need to pay attention to my dynamic range. But all good things in time, right? You got to get the basics down first and then get to that. So is that a situation where, you know, it's worth being aware of, but do you need to worry about it? That's exactly what it is. It's worth being aware of, but you don't need to worry about it. The articles are written for the majority of the photography that we do. One person reached out to me and asked me about working with strobes. How do you handle that? So I have an article that'll go up this weekend that's kind of a follow-up and it's an add-on for strobes. The article that I shared with you guys is the last show that we did from PhotoFocus. Uh, Vanelli, who wrote that article, actually talked about strobes and strobe lighting in that article. And um, unfortunately, I think he made it a little bit confusing because he kind of tied it in with, with my theory. And it's, it's, I feel it's actually very separate. But uh, at the end of the day, we both take the same approach. Um, when I'm shooting with lights, whether it be studio strobes, whether it be LED lights, but if my primary lighting source is lighting, meaning strobes or LEDs, I'm determining my exposure before I even turn the light on. So I'm still basically shutter speed with purpose, aperture with feeling. The only thing I'm not doing is adjusting the brightness with ISO because I'm going to shoot at my base ISO if I'm working with lights. Then when I turn the lights on, I'm going to adjust the power of the lights until I have a perfect exposure. So I'm going to break that down in an article. For those of you that are shooting you know, predominantly natural light, um, at this point, there's really no reason to you know, even be worried about that. But when you start working with strobes, yes, um, the version of how to do exposure with strobe lighting that I'm going to give you is much, much simpler than the way I learned. Uh, and it's much simpler than setting up all your strobes and turning them on and then trying to figure out what the right exposure is and adjusting the power of each of the strobes. That makes it 10 times harder. It's incredibly inefficient, especially if you're photographing a person because while you're putzing with all that, you've got a person sitting there like, do they have any clue what they're doing? Like, this is taking forever. What's, okay? Uh, so the system that I'm going to give you, the version I'm going to give you, um, much simpler, much faster, much more efficient, and it's much more accurate. So look for that article before we talk again next week. Okay. Now I want to go back um, through the Q and A here or the, the the chat here because I know there were some questions uh, in general. So let's switch gears a little bit. We'll do a little bit Q and A, and I also I do have a shot breakdown. Um, We'll see how much time we have left, and I'll do that shot breakdown for you at the end. It's the cover shot from tonight's um, um, YouTube thumbnail. Uh, but if not, we'll do that one next week because I really want to make sure I get everybody's uh, questions here. So um, let's see. Let's, actually, let's go all the way back to the beginning because that's where we were starting on this here. Um, where are we at? Uh, for, again, all of, those, all of those of you that said Happy New Year and that, Thank you. Same to you. Let's kick some asses here. All right. Uh, you know, no resolutions, none of that stuff. Let's just do the work. Let's make a difference. Right. And, and when I say make a difference, I'm talking about be selfish, make a difference, improve your photography, be creative, push yourself outside the box and grow. Okay. That's my challenge. All right. So Blair had a question here uh, early on. Let's scroll through these here. Blair asked, is there a way to make a mannequin head less reflective and more matte? Can I use makeup on the plastic? Okay. So, uh, Blair, my mannequin, Lola is her name. By the way, Blair, if you have a mannequin, it is a requirement. You must give him or her a name. The internet said so somewhere along the way. Anyway, um, mine is not overly reflective at all. I have no problem with mine. It, it's got kind of a soft matte finish to it, um, manages light really, really well. In fact, manages light very, very much like skin does. Um, so I don't run into problems with reflections or hot spots or any of that kind of stuff. 
Um, and I'm not trying to make you spend money, Blair, but I will share with you a link here in the chat. This is for a page that's on my website with all my gear. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page, when you get there, all the way at the bottom, you will find Lola. Um, Lola is actually really reasonably priced, $49, right? Um, so not to say that you gotta go out and buy a new one. So if you have a mannequin that is uh, particularly shiny, uh, I would test this not on the face first, right? But um, try um, either, if you want something that's a little bit more temporary and something that could be removed, try hairspray. Um, the other option, if you want something that's gonna be a little bit more permanent, but test it before you do it on the face of the mannequin, uh, matte spray. The stuff that we used to spray on, which you can still buy, spray on prints to dull the gloss surface, matte spray would work really, really well. Um, as far as a mannequin that you can put makeup on, uh, I do believe they make mannequin heads that you can put makeup on. Um, but I'd be curious, Blair, and, and type, and let me know if I'm missing something. I'd be curious why you want to be able to put makeup on the mannequin. So Lola, the one that I shared with you a moment ago, does have basic makeup on her. Um, so she photographs quite attractive. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't think you'll find a full-length mannequin that you could add and remove makeup easily. But I do know they make mannequins for cosmetology schools uh, so that people can can practice on them. So um, that would be probably your best bet if you really need that, okay? Uh, Blair had another question here. Let me slide that down. Um, when using a fogger and strobes to enhance a background, I assume uh, to only use reflectors and not other diffusing modifiers. Um, not necessarily. So I'm going to guess, Blair, that you're referring to like the rim lights in that case. Um, I never, so <laughs> this will upset some people, but this is a, this is a freaking YouTube thing, right? So rim lights and hair lights, right? So rim lights, they're the ones that come in from the back, boom, this way, right? Hair lights from above. Uh, you can see the hair light that's ab ab above me. It puts like a little bit of a highlight on my head and puts a little bit of a highlight on my shoulders. Like if I come forward more, you see how that highlight disappeared from my shoulder over here. And then if I back up, the hair light kicks in just a little bit. Of highlight. Same with my head, right? If I, if I come in, the highlight's going, whoops, sorry, the highlight's going on this side, okay? So anyway, um, I never put modifiers on rim lights or hair lights. And when I say modifiers, soft boxes, strip boxes, any of that kind of stuff. There's no reason to. The most that, it, and please don't tell me like, well, you want to make the rim light softer. Feather the strobe. Like why set up all that big honking gear and plus why spend all that money? You don't need to, just feather the strobe. The only modifiers that ever go on my rim lights or hair lights would be Magmod gels for color. And if for some reason I've got a shot where I've moved that light in close and it's coming right at the edge of my frame and I don't want flare, then I'll go ahead and I'll use the Magmod grid over top of the gel. Um, so if you're talking about rims and, and hair lights, um, I mean, you can still diffuse them, right? I mean, if you have a strip box or whatever, um, it's going to do the same thing. The only difference is you won't get as much contrast in your smoke um, and, and, and in your haze and, and that type of stuff. Um, the real thing or the real important thing to pay attention to, Blair, when you're gonna, if you're going to start playing around with strobes and, and smoke machines or foggers and that kind of stuff, the real important thing to pay attention to is the inverse square law. It, it, well, actually, two things. I'm sorry. Depth of field and inverse square law. So let's do inverse square law first, right? So remember, normally when we set up a shot with a person, we're going to do our metering from the light to the person. But if you're going to put smoke behind your subject, right out of the box, that puts that smoke two feet closer, on average, 
or more, but at least two feet closer to the light than the subject is, which means since smoke tends to be white, it's actually gonna blow out, it's gonna overexpose, right? So don't set up your shot with no smoke, mirror the rim light for the person's head, everything looks perfect, and then go ahead and put smoke two feet behind them because that smoke is gonna be bright white or overexposed color. So gotta pay attention to inverse square law, right? In the sense of what do you want the light to do? How do you want it to interact? But the other thing to factor in when you're using smoke um, is depth of field. Super, super important because if you have a lot of depth of field, you're gonna pick up all the detail in the smoke and that can be really cool. It can be very dramatic. If you have shallower depth of field, the smoke is gonna be more misty feeling, kind of dreamy with some highlights and shadows in it. Very different emotional vibe in that regard, right? Um, so hopefully that helped. I didn't notice here if, if he got me another one in here. Uh, oh, so he did say on the matic, and just to give it a more matte appearance, yeah, I would say try hairspray to be able to take it on and off and or matte spray. Um, those would probably be the best two. And then as far as the modifiers on the fogger, I hope that helps out, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Annette, we're staying awake for it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I saw another question here. Joe, with social media, should you also put the copyright info on your profiles as well? Uh, no, not really, because the uh, platform rules of... Um, Facebook, Instagram, all those supersede anything that you would put on. You know, we get those platforms for free, so we have to abide by them. And definitely, please don't watermark your images. You've all heard me talk about watermarks many, many times. Watermarks are for amateurs. Done. End of conversation. If I've offended any of you with that, let's talk about it. We're going to run out of time tonight, but let's talk about it. Leave me a comment, and I'll talk about it again next week. It's something that I strongly, strongly believe in and I can break it down for you and I know I can convince you, okay? Um, but um, now on your profiles, there's really not not a lot of value uh, to do it. And, and keep in mind, even putting a copyright notice on your website doesn't override copyright law or anything like that at all, okay? So especially in the United States, copyright law is a, is a very interesting... Um, very interesting category. Maybe a couple weeks down the road, once we kind of get well into the year, maybe I'll um, I'll do a session on copyright law. In fact, I, I when I used to do the podcast, I had a copyright attorney uh, on. Uh, maybe I'll see if I can get her back that we can talk a little bit about um, copyrights and kind of the things you should know. But um, just putting a copyright notice on your website doesn't It, it doesn't mean you're gonna make a ton of money if somebody steals something that you're doing. Let's put it that way, right? Ultimately, you have to register for copyrights if you're gonna do that. But should you still do it? Yes, you should, okay? Uh, it still can have benefits for you if you ever find yourself in a lawsuit or dispute over your um, information. So I would encourage you definitely do it. But for social media, uh, not really much of an issue there, okay? Um, let's see here, what else do we have? Um, Hector, uh, oh, George Shearis was interesting to research as a wildlife photographer. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm actually not familiar with that name, so I'll have to check that one out. Um, all right, and then Blair, good. I gave you the stuff you were looking for for, um, for the fogger. Awesome. So, yeah, we're at 7 o'clock. I'll do the shot breakdown next week. I promise I'll give you two of them next week. Um, and we'll do that. In the meantime, um, I encourage you... As always, you gotta shoot pictures, dang, right? Uh, some of you I know are uh, literally prolific shooters, others, eh, not so much, right? And we always have reasons, we always have excuses. I know myself, I found myself going into the second half of last year, um, business was good. I was doing a lot of teaching, I was generating a lot of content, and literally my shooting was trailing off. I was getting into the studio like once a week 
and man, was I feeling it. So, you know, I got to December and it's like, okay, I got to practice what I preach. And I wanted to, I was really feeling deprived. So, you know, now I'm back to a point where I'm getting in two, sometimes three shoots a week in the studio. Plus, I got a couple other little projects that I'm working on that I'll share some stuff. You know, I've been shooting abstracts, but I've got a few other projects that I've been working on that I will share in the coming months with all of you. Um, very much looking forward to baseball starting up in March. Uh, so I'll be shooting a lot of baseball and sports and getting outdoors again. But um, yeah, you got to pick up the camera. You got to shoot. That's what it's all about. But this year, we are. We're going to really nail down exposure. I want to see everybody getting amazing exposures all the time. And we're hopefully going to really continue to, to talk some sense into people about how photography has changed right underneath your noses. And on one hand, yeah, we all see the changes. You know, Sony has a global shutter, yada, yada. No, I mean, it's, it's really changed a lot. And we still talk about it like it's 1999. Hmm, that could be a song. Anyway, we do. And that's unfortunate because by doing that and by thinking that way, we're missing out on a lot of the opportunity that the gear that we have, that you already had in your bags, provides for you. So we need to reset a lot of that thinking. And that's my big mission for the year. So next week, more cool stuff. Of course, another shop breakdown or the shop breakdowns and uh, another last frame Q&A. Uh, if you can't make it to the shows live, you can always leave your questions in the comment below. I'll do my best to answer them next week. Don't forget, I stand by my offer. If you think I'm missing the boat on this exposure conversation, Fill out the form on my website. I'm not looking to like have an argument. I, I would love to hear your side of it and, and let's clarify any misconceptions because believe me, there has been plenty of feedback people have given me that have helped me craft this message. This shouldn't just all pop out of my head and it was perfect, okay? So I, I am putting in the time and putting in the effort and putting in the energy behind it because I really, really believe in it. And that said, if you still need to do so, please thumbs up. It helps other photographers find out about the show. And remember, gang, you don't get back the days that you waste. No resolutions, but come on, it's a new year. So let's make it a good one. Go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang. Take care. 